Oh boy, oh boy, we are here with the Steven Samino Says Boom Podcast, issue 12, our annual episode. Boom! Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Steven Samino Says Boom podcast, issue 12, our annual issue. Some people can't believe we made it. I can't believe we made it. I'm your host, John Samino, with our co-host. And my name's Steve Houston. Boom! Boom. And we have our man from the grotto at the bottom of the auto, the our technical <laughs> guy and our third, our, our third musketeer. Auto? Yeah. Hi, good to see everybody. I can't believe I hung around. I can't believe you guys let me stay for 12 issues. I mean, uh, in the original is issue, we, we had Roy Thomas on episode eight. I screwed up. I thought Steve was going to bring my neck out through the uh, through the video camera. Unfortunately, I began walking all the way to the East Coast, but I got tired. So you're yeah, like, I bet you did. I bet you did. And also, guys, please, as always, comment, share, like, subscribe. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, you're watching this, um, and we hope you enjoy it. We've had great content and thank you to john and steve for putting this together and all our special guests including for this special issue john what issue is this this is issue 12 our annual and of course we got the legend roy thomas but we're gonna have a little surprise that hasn't been done in a podcast ever before a little quick cameo by the very elusive the very beautiful the majestic dan thomas Congratulations, Steve, Otto, John, on the 12th edition. And I hope we're all around to see the 1200th edition. Who's this one? Great. Bye. Bye. That wow. is, we got Dan Thomas, her first. This, she's like the J.D. Salinger of comics. And we <laughs> got her. And on our 12th issue, it had to, I, believe me, I had to work hard on the field for that. Right, yes, Roy? Yes, Roy's right, going to yeah. be getting the beaten later on. I, I might survive. <laughs> But so on our 12th annual issue, we have the legend Roy Thomas here. And I just like to tell people really quickly, make sure to pick up this by, by my, Mike Avella, the, the creating Marvel's legendary Wolverine. And it's probably one of the best boat ex told ex exactly the way it was. Right, Roy? Of Pretty how cool. yeah, Wolverine yeah, was created. Yeah, whatever. Endorsed by the man himself, Mike Avelli. Pick this up anytime. We're just showing that because it's a great book. Wolverine creating Marvel's legendary mutants. Okay, Steve, we are here at issue number 12. Last time we had Roy on on issue eight, it was, I think, right? Uh, seems like only yesterday. Seems like only yesterday. It was great, Steve. Take us away, Steve. You're the guy that starts this thing going, and you're the guy with the true knowledge that fanboys need to hear. Well, again, it's a real honor, and I, we had such a good reaction to issue uh, number eight. A lot of people love getting into the weeds. Uh, now, of course, I can you know, also bring up some of my favorite stuff that I love from Roy, a material that not only did I love, but it changed my life in many ways in regards to collecting what I was doing, and I'm, I'm looking forward to getting into that today, but also uh we had a previous issue with mr steve engelhart and oh, steve was dropping that. some first-hand knowledge and uh, i i am looking forward to uh getting some verification today on some of the stuff that was said uh and i'm particularly interested about one subject in particular and that is the arrival of steve engelhart on captain america so that's where i want to begin today all right. First, I have to apologize if you hear an occasional bit of my dogs barking in the background. They're a particularly unruly crew. Can you hear them? Can you guys hear them? A little bit, but it's okay. Well, I can't yeah, hear I them. Think, I don't think it'll come through the glass that, that yeah. much. They'll, they'll calm down after a little while. It's the hound of the Baskervilles out there, you know? Anyway, it's okay. Well, I, I I can, uh, very minor. 
can do that, you know, that isn't going to cause an eternal eruption between me and uh, between Steve and me. It'd be fine. <laughs> Steve Englehart, not Steve. Yeah. <laughs> so or either one. So, so go ahead, Steve. What did you want to ask? Rory? So obviously, because um, I, I saw the episode, so you know, so I'm vaguely familiar with it. You know, it's you definitely know. A, a, a fascinating period in time. One is now, if I'm correct here, according to my research, uh, on the Captain Americas issue 153, Steve Englehart comes on board. Okay, that is September number, 1972. Yeah. Yeah. In September 1972, you have just become. The editor, the mm -hmm. man. Okay. No, and I, was the, I was the boy. Stan was the man. I, was the boy. <laughs> I might be editor in chief, but I'm still the boy to him. Well, I, I would never, I could never think of you as the boy. It's just not going to work that way. It, to me, you're going to be the man. Uh, so we talked with Steve, and I was, could, I'm completely enamored with that first story arc that he did, where. He, did, he delved into this history of the 1954 Captain America, brought it back in an incredible story. And as you mentioned before, in issue eight, you know, Captain America had sort of been floundering in sales that hadn't, you know, struck a chord. And suddenly Steve comes along and he's like firing on all four cylinders. And I was astonished to learn. And what he told me was it wasn't his original idea. It was something that you suggested to him. So I want to use this opportunity to, you know, find out where did you get that idea from? How come you mentioned it to him? Well, I've always been a, uh, you know, continuity freak or, you know, if they want to use that term or whatever. And we, Steve is too. We yeah, are right. too. We, Otto we is too. In various ways. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to be slavish with it, but, you know. My feeling about continuity in comic books, and, and this comes from being a kid right on through, was that if the people who are writing and drawing the comics don't care enough to keep to, to make the feeling of that this is a person's life, even if it's a super character's life, then why should the reader care about it? If uh, you know, it used to bother me as a kid when Batman would fight a, a Martian, and he did occasionally, even before the 60s, even you know, and back during my day. When I was a kid and Superman would fight a Martian and they'd be different Martians. Like there's no connection between them. It, you know, it wasn't a, a universe. These were guys who knew each other. They appeared together on the cover of world's finest comics. And they'd been in at least one, one good issue of all star together. And yet somehow or other, you know, they were, they were obviously living in different, different universes, you know, even if they shared stories occasionally or, or in world's finest. So, I just, I, I like the idea. That was one of the reasons why I became so enamored. Uh, uh, Julie Schwartz's comics had some of that, but it didn't, it didn't really splash over for the most part to the rest of DC. But Stan, because of his being the, the accident, really, in a sense, of his being the writer and the editor of most of the books and controlling them all, uh, his brother was you know, originally writing some of them, you know, too, that all he didn't have to make a conference or make a big deal, you know, to get this, to get uh, some continuity and so forth. So he he just, you know, he was writing or controlling all the stories in varying degrees. And he just felt like if this, if he had this sense and Julie had it, Julie Schwartz had it too, to some extent that if the world was gonna, this was gonna be a real world, a real universe, then, uh, you know, it, it had to be fairly consistent. And, you know, so, uh, and one of the things about Captain America had been that I liked the idea See, oh, first I had written Stan a letter right, I don't know if it was right before or after, uh, I think it was even before that issue in which the acrobat pretended to be Captain America a, a couple of months before Avengers number four. Yeah, Strange Tales 114. And I, and I wrote a yeah. letter to Stan, uh, with, whom I really didn't write letters, I didn't write nearly as many letters to Marvel as they did to Julie Schwartz at DC in those days. But I wrote a letter saying you should bring Captain America back, you know, like because the Torch and Submariner were back in one form or another. But I said, make it be Bucky, you know, because he's grown up or something like that. Yeah. You know, make turn Bucky because, you know, I'd be mm. assuming, you know, that maybe he's had super sir. I wasn't thinking that far ahead. But and uh, St uh, I think I got a letter back from Stan, one of my few, saying that, uh, well, you know, we have other plans, but you'll see soon. And, you know, a few weeks later, Avengers number four comes out. And wow. Fine. And I liked that. I thought it was very ingenious, this whole idea of he's frozen in ice. Wow. But it it offended my sense of continuity, although not the Marvel continuity, because, you know, they didn't really 
clash over with cowed over with uh, timely at that stage. But it still offended me in a certain sense because I knew that there that 1945 to 1949, for another three to four years, there was a Captain America comic with Bucky in it, too. Most of the time, he got knocked out the last few issues in favor of Sun Girl. But, you know, and then and not only that, but then in the 19 in 1953, all of a sudden, here's Captain. Here's Steve Rogers as a teacher and Bucky is one of the students. And they come out of uh, retirement to fight the Red Skull, who's gone from being a Nazi to being a commie. You know, he'll be a Rotarian. <laughs> yes. But anyway, uh, but. And I love those stories, you know, set in the uh, post-Korean War period, the, the very anti-commie stories and all that. That was that I love that stuff. And I, so I always liked the idea of of doing something about that. But you know, I never really had the opportunity to do anything like that in Avengers, you know, because of Captain America. Even when he was in, it was only one of a number of characters. And I didn't really want to write the Captain America book. So when I assigned Steve, that's about the same time. Did he start doing Avengers and Captain America about the same time? Yes, was, basically. Uh, Avengers, you know, when I became editor. Yeah, he, he basically started. You you become editor of Avengers at, uh, in issue 103. Yeah. And as far as I remember correctly, he starts like issue 107. Okay. What? Oh, well, yeah. So he he, he started, starts writing. Of Avengers, he started with number 105. Okay, 105. Yeah, because I did the first one. You became editor in issue 103. I remember. But yeah, I don't know about Captain, was he doing Captain America before? I don't think he was doing Captain America before he was doing Avengers. Was he was a little a month or two later or about the same time? Do you know? It's pretty close in time. I know. He starts Captain America just before. Okay. Well, yeah, it doesn't make that much difference. So the main thing is, you know, uh, I mean, Steve had been writing, I guess, The Beast and so forth, doing a good job of it. And, yes. And it was time for a bigger assignment and everything like that. You know, I had to give up stuff. And, you know, uh, the the top writers, you know, were the, you know, uh, at the, the very top writers and so forth. But Steve was entering that category quickly. You know, Jerry Conway, what I don't know how much Len was doing at the time. We're trying to get him over. You know, Barb was, you know, about to, come, was co about to come over and things like that. And a few other people. So I was trying to get a good good group of people. I was hoping would have buy, liked to got Archie over. I never quite did. He came over right after I left. Uh, but uh, so... I wanted to have Steve do Captain America. It seemed like a logical, good book for him to do. It, it, it needed some help, and he and he was a good writer and doing you know and everything. So I made this suggestion. I, th I thought not, I don't know if I ins exactly insisted on it, but I just you know pushed a little bit to to do something with. Now I don't remember. Uh, you know, it, I know that my my real idea, but maybe I didn't express it clearly. My real idea was for him to do something about that whole thing. The whole thing of 1945 to 49 and mm. 53 to 54 in the same, you know, you know, but uh, whether I made it cl clear or not, Steve decided to just take the, the 50s part of that. And he ignored the fact that there had been a Captain America from 45 to 49. He just came, and he made it a character that was, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, crazed super patriot kind of character. And it really, it really, I'll tell you the truth, it really wasn't what I'd had in mind. I hadn't had in mind, you know, making Captain America a, a crazed kind of villain. But, you know, that was Steve's business. I didn't really care. You know, I thought about, okay, you know, if that's Steve's take on it, it doesn't, it doesn't affect me because to me, I still love those 50 stories. And that and there's no connection to me between those 50 stories drawn so beautifully by Ramita, my favorite work of his by far, by the way, not Spider-Man is his Captain America of that period. But, you know, those stories were always going to be there and it didn't make any difference what happened now, you know, and so forth. So if Steve wanted to do that, it's, he certainly did it very, very well. So, uh, you know, so I just, I just kind of, you know, let him go with it was encouraging. And, uh, you know, near the end, got a little nervous about it looking like he was fighting Nixon as the head of Hydra or something, but we kind of fudged that around. <laughs> we sort of had to in a way because, you know, you think about it. Okay. So Nixon shoots himself in the White House or whatever. <laughs> well, you know, whatever anybody happens, Nixon didn't shoot himself in the White House. So it was always kind of vague as to whether that was the president or wasn't the president. I figured, well, that's good enough. Yeah. And the lucky thing is that Stan as the publisher never really noticed, you know, and everything to, you know, I don't think he ever really complained because he would, you know, he wouldn't have really been that wild about the idea of being so involved. He wouldn't have liked the idea of make it look like the the president of the United States was the head of Hydra, got <laughs> himself in the Oval Office or something, you know. But I don't think Stan ever noticed, you know, so forth. So uh, Steve got away with that as he got away with, uh, 
the God thing, you know, a few years later. But uh, and he did make the book sell. Now, when he said the other the other uh, some weeks ago that Captain America became, you know, I don't remember exactly, but, the, the, you know, like Marvel's best selling book. That's that's true in one sense. And that is he's he's uh, he's talking. I assume he realized this. He's talking about percentage sales, meaning it sold a bigger. Now, obviously, it didn't have the print run of Spider-Man. So it wasn't selling as many copies as Spider-Man or FF okay. or several other books, but it was selling a large percentage. And that's important. That's the major thing. The first time that really happened, I think, was uh, when John when John Ramita took over from Wally Wood, you know, one talent taking over from another great talent. Uh, and when and the book had been very selling very well, understand, and Wally, and it immediately picked up. And within the three or four issues of the time that John was doing it, Daredevil would became the highest percentage selling book, you know, again, with a lower print run because it hadn't been, you know, it was a new book and had a low print run. Captain America, I don't know. It wasn't like it was a low print run, but, you know, it wasn't one of the very highest, but it was in the middle range. They may have dropped it a little simply because it hadn't been selling as well. But uh, it, yeah, it, but it did pick up and it said, suddenly had some of the best numbers around and that showed that, and his, his Avengers did a, about, you know, at least about as well as mine. I'm kind of jealous about that, you know, <laughs> and he did it with lesser artists, as Steve has said, it's true. As the editor, I, you know, I saw to it, I worked with uh, whoever I want. I had John, well, not always, but I had John Buscema and, you know, and uh, Sal Buscema when he first came in and, you know, other, you know, and of course, you know, uh, Neil when he came in and so forth. And uh, Steve managed to pull off the same trick, but without quite the stellar talent. I don't mean they weren't talented because he had Sal Buscema, whom I worked with too, but he also, but he had a couple other people and they were good people, but he never had, you know, he didn't, wasn't working with John Buscema, you know, or, things like that. And, and he still managed to make it, you know, sell very well. So Steve was obviously, you know, a rising star and right up there with shows you Jerry show, and the others shows you back then a good story could still sell the yeah. book. You know, if you think about yeah. that, like a good, honest to and God if Steve story. wanted to tell a, a different story than what I had originally had in mind. That didn't really bother me as long as it was good. And it sold comics, you know, right, that's all right. I cared about. I hated to see Captain America do that in a way but you know it, but the, the readers loved it my job was to sell comic books and i think i think steve did an excellent job of it and he went on to other good things after that go ahead steve yeah so you know it's definitely uh, a fascinating aspect in the, the you know these last couple of uh you know months now that you know we've got to speak with steve and now you and those questions have been in my mind for an eternity you know, you just call I know me. other You're people. Don't give me my number. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you in Vegas. You're going to ask me then. Yeah, but it, I was. Remember, I'm, I'm. There's so many. We only touched the surface of what you know, <laughs> that I want to talk to. So every now and again, I'll get uh, uh, some clarity. But you know, now that we've had Steve Engelhart here, I I also want to stress the fact. You're a continuity freak. You're a continuity nut. Okay, and that is <laughs> Thank you essential. Much. OK, if you're going to be an yeah. editor, you better know who, what, why and when. When you handed off that task to Steve Engelhart, he was also a continuity freak, mm -hmm. a nut. Yeah. And he got more and more complicated as mm -hmm. it goes on. And that's why I want to stress to anyone who is watching this podcast right now. It had to be someone of that quality. If you had handed it over to someone that hated the product had only read three issues, yeah. didn't know what the Captain America was. It, everything would have fallen and it would have faltered. And you, you would have had to replace Steve in two minutes, okay, with someone else. However, probably <laughs> looking back here, you know, we have an example of an editor just making a suggestion and then getting out of the way and allowing Steve to do what he wants to do and sales rise, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. uh, we have heard many stories of people coming in and, you know, being heavy handed, you know, go, oh, you can't do this and do that. But, you know, when we look at the history of the titles, the writing, becoming an editor and then transitioning off to different people, you know, that period, 1972, 73 for Marvel. Hmm. <sighs> Wow. Crazy. I agree. It's a crazy era. You know, you have that initial burst with Stan and Jack and, you know, and Steve, the initial burst. But even by, let's face it, by 
1969, that initial burst, sort of the, the balloon was dropping a little yeah. bit. You know, Doctor Strange had to be cancelled. Nick Fury, you know, uh, was cancelled. There was time for new blood. And so mm-hmm. to hear those original stories from these people, okay, who came in, you know, under your tutelage, basically, you know, Jerry Conway, you know, uh, the Steve Engelhart. Well, I hate to hear that word tutelage because I didn't teach them very much. You know? Well, I mean, <laughs> uh, sponsorship, shall we say. Bring okay. it in. All right. All right. Uh, you know, it's definitely an important thing. And, and they were able to create the classic stories later on that we, the, you know, that we got today. Uh, so definitely the Captain America story was definitely at the forefront of my mind of what leaving someone alone can do. Steve, beautifully said, and this is something I always wanted to ask Roy because his his run was the next spark, and it like all those other great legendary characters come. But this is what I want to ask Roy, and I don't think this has ever been asked of Roy. Obviously, you started hiring people that all truly became legends too. They followed you. Now you had an eye for detail, so I mean, you even had a hand with Denny O'Neill maybe talking to Stan about it and doing it. Yeah. But then you bring in all these other guys. We would just talked about Steve Gerber previously. We talked about uh, David Anthony Kraft and the list goes on and on for you. Starlin. Boom. They all became these huge legends. I want to ask you a question. When you looked at a writer and you saw what they did, what were you looking at that you knew that they had to, where did that come from? Like, because you were almost a hundred percent with these people. What did you look for in that you knew they were going to be something? I'm, this is I've never asked this. I, to I before. never read their stuff that carefully, you know. So <laughs> oh, no, I, no. I, you know, I, they they were literate people. But how did you? They know? liked the comics. They kind they seemed to kind of understand, you know, the comics. I because uh, even Stan didn't see what you saw, and he and not he, always. Though. No, <laughs> no, but that's what I'm saying is like, how did you see these people? You created. And, and you well, Frankenstein monstered these guys into no I no they I think what it is is they created themselves I just kind of recognized them and, and benefited from but what it. Did I didn't you, really I didn't you know but what did like you I see these what did you see that you knew that they were going to be good well uh it was a little easier with that first batch like uh Jerry and Len and Marv maybe you know especially look at those uh, three because you know they, yeah no. they are three of the the big names to come out of that period along with steve you know and so forth and a couple of others and they uh but the thing is they already had cut their teeth at dc so i and i'd read a couple of their stories and i sort of you know and i could see that you know they could write and, and there's, there's two things one they could just generally write comics they already knew how to write it joe orlando and dick giordano and a couple of others had sort of done my spade work for me in one sense so you know i didn't have to teach them how to write i could thing is i could teach somebody to some extent how to write i could because i'd been a teacher i've been you know and i could teach and edit and i could but i didn't have the time a and b i didn't really have the ambition i i had i hated teaching so much when i was a teacher that i didn't want to spend time teaching people i wanted people that could do it and everything and it's not very fair because Stan spent a lot of time teaching me and I spent almost no time teaching anybody else. <laughs> I, I wanted to get people that already knew kind of what they were doing. And my feeling was, you know, if you found the right person, they got, and they've got the spark and they've got a talent and they're literate and they're in, they're interested in Marvel in the first place and they want to be there. You know, it wasn't like, you know, they might've also been happy being at DC, you know, like Len was like, wanted to do Batman or whatever, you know, but they were, People who knew Marvel, they they had been reading Marvel since pretty much the beginning, which at that stage was about a decade. And all I had to do was see, you know, if they wanted to kind of get into that. And and they, the nice thing is they had a, they already had a frame of reference. They had it just in terms of writing, along with the art too, because you know some of them were partly artists, and certainly they paid a lot of attention to the art. But in ter- even in terms of just writing, they had two major frames of reference in particular. They had Stan. I mean, you can't get any bigger than that at Marvel. Okay. And they had to, you know, me, which was a lesser extent because it was still like it was that I was kind of a, you know, offshoot of Stan in a way, right. with a little of my own style. But it was I was trying to do the same kind of thing. So we weren't fighting each other. It was one kind of style that was kind of evolving. And I and I think, you know, I, I just figured these people sort of know what to do. They may not do it right all the time. Neither did I. Neither did Stan. You know, but the thing is, they they knew what to try to do. They knew. They knew the kind of thing that Marvel was. And if I had some 
complain about it or I didn't like a character, this and that. At least they'd understand where it was coming from because they knew what Marvel had. They knew what Stan did. They knew what Jack did. They knew what Ditko had done. So all I had to do was kind of, you know, a little, more, not so much guidance, it's just kind of, you know, inspire them a tiny little bit, you know, and and, and then just kind of keep out of the way. Once in a while, I had a, a clash or two with, you know, with one or two of them and everything. But, you know, it didn't mean that, uh, you know, I didn't respect their writing and uh, we usually got past it, you know. But you bring in like, like a... Free, uh, Gary Friedrich and like yeah. like and, that was and, earlier even. yeah earlier but I'm just saying like yeah. did you know he was going to be as good as he was going to yeah. be or you just gave him a chance oh, no I, I didn't I have no idea but Gary was my best friend since we were like in high school together and, and met at the Palace Theater you know and so forth when I was maybe 16 or so and he was 13 and we were best friends for many years and and uh, we're still friends at least uh, you know as close as we could be from the distance with various his health problems you know, right up to the end when he died a couple of years ago. But I, I actually, the thing is, you know, Gary was a more, was a different kind of writer. He wasn't, he wasn't the same as Steve and Jerry and Len and Marv and a couple of the other people that came in because he was never as much of a Marvel fan and a comics fan as they were. He liked comics. He read them. He started reading them because, after I brought that copy of the first Green Lantern showcase in. And he, but he, and he liked Marvel. And he, you know, and so forth. But he, he was never as much of a comics fan or, or cared about as much as as I did. He sort of got into it because of me. I was the older guy, you know, and so forth. And we hung around together. And he did a really good job writing. He wasn't as polished as the other guys, kind of in a way. But he did some really good work. I mean, he, you can't fault the guy who came up with the idea for the motorcycle riding ghost rider. <laughs> you know, you can't say that. Uh, you know, it wasn't like it was a minor it's, accomplishment. But Roy hiring like a murder's row of writers that just was consistently over and over. I mean, it, it's it's it's. It, I know you downplay it, but I don't. I can't think of any editor that had as many. Well, they people. all. But they all had. Uh, I think, all, with rare exceptions, they all had professional credits maybe yeah, but maybe david still Kraft had... didn't because uh, uh, he had mostly been doing that fanzine on otis adelbert right. Klein, but, but you even can... he was writing. right but you still gave them a chance and even i know steve mr houston over oh, here loves yeah. gerber what yeah. but well, what, is, that, what, is... what, what gerber's experience was that he wrote to me at, uh, and his you know he knew me and my first wife Jeannie. yeah uh mainly because he had served as the beard ones when we dated uh Jeannie's parents didn't like me at all <laughs> I'd had a goatee, and even when I shaved it, they still said I was a bearded bum, and they didn't want to grab me. I'd been a teacher, and that had no connection with it. I think she's just a few years younger than me. Roy Thomas is so, a bum. So I hired, so I, well, you know, just a few. And uh, so I, at one time, I had Steve go over and, and pick her up because her parents didn't want me coming by. So Steve picked her up <laughs> and turned her over to me. So he was the beard in that case. And Steve, I got to know Steve when he was in. He was in like junior high in University City, which is a suburb of St. Louis. And I was still living in Jackson, just about to become a teacher. And even when I became a teacher in the St. Louis, first it wasn't, but uh, it was like 100 miles west. But then when I was a teacher in the St. Louis area, I was in the south. So we weren't like neighbors. He wasn't at my school or anything like it. And our age difference was about, I don't know, 10 or so years. Oh, is that much? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because okay. I was a teacher and he's in junior high, you know, and I'm 22 or so, you know. And so, you know. It, it's a little a little different, you know, and so forth. And he had his several friends. I used to go up to his house. Okay, I don't know if he got to come out of my place, but but I, I went up to his house in University City and met his parents, and we we'd have we'd have good talks and things like that. You know, I I was going to do that thing called crudzine, and I shoved that over to him, and he did that. And and I liked Steve, but I kind of forgot about him. The next thing he turned up on my radar was a few weeks after uh, I I moved to New York. First, I got. And I was staying with Dave Kaler, who I'd gotten some work for doing uh, Captain Adam and stuff at uh, Charlton. He did a good job. And I was sleeping on a mattress on the floor, you know. And then then he came in uh, around September or something like that. And wherever it was. And and there was another mattress. So Denny's there for a while. <laughs> Isn't that and then, crazy? And then th the next person to come to town really wasn't Gary. Somewhere in the middle there, Steve Gerber came to town <laughs> because he graduated from the eighth grade. And his parents gave him a, a trip to New York as a present. So he wrote me because he knew I was in New York. Wow. And so, and, and so he sleeps on a mattress for a week. <laughs> Got to meet Stan. I took him in to meet Stan. So he met Stan, had a big, long conversation. It was wow. going to be a couple of minutes. And he and Stan hit it off. And so they're talking. He's talking to wow. the guy at that time. He's, what, 17, 18 you know, years old. 
And then Steve goes off to, uh, I, I think, well, that's the end of seeing him. You know, he's, he's in St. Louis. I'm here. And we had almost no contact, maybe once or twice. I, mean, I saw him. But, of course, he did. But I saw him back in St. Louis a time or two in a convention. And, you know, and he helped me about the time I was getting ready to elope with Jeannie and everything. And uh, but that was, you know, kind of, a, you know, from a distance. We weren't close friends, but we were kind of friends. And then one day, uh, I, Jeannie and I get this uh, letter from him. And it's because uh, he was working in advertising in St. Louis. I'm not sure exactly what he was doing, copywriting and different things. This is like 19, what was it be, 71, 72 before we split up, I guess somewhere in there. What time? When did Steve come to work for Marvel? But it's about that time. About or, that time. Yeah, he, he, he got there in 72. Okay. So he so he's so he's right, you know. So he's this is of course, you know, it's a few months early, and he suddenly writes this letter. And what it basically, and actually, I think this is pretty close to a quote of one sentence. He says, help, I'm going crazy doing <laughs> advertising. You know, I mean, as, as Jeannie said later, but we didn't know it was not necessarily a work-related illness. You know, Steve was always <laughs> kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah. We loved him, you know, but he was crazy. So uh, I said, well, you know, I said, I, I knew he could could write a little bit. He he used to write these comics back when he was in junior high and I first met him. He would on some kind of paper that was somewhere between comic book paper and toilet paper. He had found <laughs> some it, it banned. I mean, you know, and he would draw these long stories with sort of stick figures. It was like the Legion of Superheroes on steroids. I mean, they all the characters looked exactly alike, but they had a different symbol. And he, it some sort of Legion of Superheroes name. And he would mail them to me these 30, 40, 50 page stories. And I would oh my glance God. at them and send them back. Talk about ambition. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so forth. And he has a letter in one of the he has, I think, the very first Alter Ego Letters column that uh, when uh, either Jerry or Ron Foss had it. There's a letter from Steve Gerber in there first, right off the bat. He had his own wow. fanzine going right away, headline. Wow. See? Wow. And uh, then he dropped out of that to do this stuff. He was married by that time. You know, so he's trying to live, but he's just going kind of nuts. And uh, so he came to, I, I I think he, I think he arrived about right after Jeannie and I had separated because I remember he went shopping for me. I was trying to improve my life. So I went out and bought a beanbag chair. You know, that's, <laughs> that's what you did in 1972 when you were uh, newly separated, you went and got a beanbag chair and hope for the best. You know? <laughs> and, and Steve and I are walking along. He just arrived in town and we, we call over this cab and then suddenly we drag out this beanbag chair and this guy is upset because we're trying to squeeze it in the back seat of his cab. You know? <laughs> and so, so, so it was, it would have been, that would have been like uh, late 72 when he yeah. finally showed up there. But uh, Steve was just, a, you know, a wild man. You know, we had a few squabbles because of things he'd want to do, but he was a real talent, you know, but he was, he was different. He was less of a, he was less of a commercial talent in the sense of, you know, knowing exactly what to do, sell comics than say Len and Marv and Jerry and Steve, you know, he had his own little odd thing. And sometimes it sold comics, sometimes it didn't, but it was always going to be different. Yeah. And sometimes it would just drive me up a wall because I knew it wasn't going to sell. And one time Stan almost threw him out the window when he made up <laughs> one door, you know, and got DC. <laughs> oh, and, and oh, God. He came so close to getting fired that day. And I'm lucky that you, you don't, you want to hear that story? Yes. Yeah, okay, well, <laughs> I love that. Adventure he he was around, unfortunately, to fill in any details. I think he'd remember this. He had made up. It was obvious that he. Had, I guess it's man thing. Was it? It, it was a man. Yeah, thing. it was one yeah, door. Seventeen. One door was just. I don't know. You reminded me vaguely of somebody. I couldn't think of who. It was Superman. <laughs> I suddenly realized it was Superman. <laughs> you know, like it was so close to Superman it, it, with with a different name, which is kind of funny since the first guy sued by Superman was Wonder Man. But Steve didn't know that. But anyway, so one door is Superman. And I saw this at some rough stage, or he told me about it, whatever it is. And I told him, Steve, I said, don't do not do this. It's too close. You got to change it a little more, you know, because I had done, you know, Squadron Sinister, but I didn't make it that close, you know. Uh, I said, you, you know, we, it's the last thing in the world Stan Lee wants to get, oh. and I, that I want Stan Lee to get, is a nasty letter from D.C. Forget about a lawsuit, just a letter from a lawyer or something or a complaint. It would send him up a wall. And uh, so I said, just you know, change it a little more. Well, I, I was kind of careless because I, you know, was busy. And so, so I assumed that, you know, I'm, I'm a simple guy. I, I'm the editor in chief of the company. I've got this writer. Uh, he had been on staff, but he had narcolepsy. So he kept falling asleep. So we had to take him off staff and just have him freelance. Right. And um, so I, I tell this guy what to do, you know, just not exactly what to do, just what not to do. Right. And, and to trying to change it. And he evidently made no, if he made any effort to change, it certainly was not, you know, anything that I noticed. 
and I got I was kind of careless, so so it kind of slips through, you know. Uh -oh. I, I mean, it was like in the middle of the story. Uh oh, so it gets you know it it gets into print. I don't know if it was the issue on sale or it was what we call the make ready, which was like the guts of the magazine, everything but the cover that came in about a week or two before the comic came out on sale. So it's way too late to you know change anything. Uh -oh. And Stan sees it. Uh oh, <laughs> I think I saw it about the same time. The Stan sees it, which is the important thing. And I mean, you know. I mean, I'm sure his wig, you know, just whew, like that, you know, and he was so mad. He called Steve in and he raked him over the coal. I, I was lucky to escape. I, I'm sort of, you know, I, 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 I told him, I said, I'm sorry. I said, I, I told him to change it. I thought he had changed right. it more and right, he right. honestly didn't. But, I, you know, it's my responsibility. Can't deny that. And he was a little teed off at me for letting that slip through. But on the other hand, the person he was really mad at, because I had talked to him about it, and he knew what to do, and he'd been on staff for a while, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ooh. I mean, Steve spent about 20, 30 minutes. They were not as pleasant as that hour that he had spent in 1965 with Stan. And he came <laughs> he came as close as probably, you know, anybody ever did except me to being fired, you know, too, by wow. Stan. But after that, I can't say Steve was really chastened, though, particularly, you know. He, wow. you know, he was just, he just had his vision and he was going to do it. And he was just going to run into the, the powers that be. And if they didn't like it, you know, uh, that's good. He, he would he only make a, certain changes. Such a rebel. And all you know, that. Oh he, he, he once threatened to quit over the ending of some mystery story in uh, a year or so in, because it, it had, he was Jewish, not practicing particularly anything, but it, there was some kind of story, one of the black and white horror mystery books. And it ended with, uh, I don't know, it, it wasn't anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic, obviously, but it was, but he was talking about, it had to do with the old ways. It was almost like, uh, uh, it's it sort of in a hint, orthodoxy as opposed to changing with the world. And it's about the old ways having to change. And the way he would it, I, I just felt like you're going to, you know, offend some Jewish people with this. Right. I don't care what you think, you know, you, you, so forth. I said, you, and uh, you have to, you have to change that, you know, ending and soften it somewhat. You have to do that. And he said, uh, uh -oh. and he said, well, I don't want to do that. I said, well, we're going to do it. He says, you're going to do it, you know, or, you know, if you don't, I'll change something. And you won't like it because I don't even know what to say. You know, I'm not <laughs> being Jewish. He says, well, what if I said I wasn't going to do it? I said, I'd say goodbye, you know. And he then saw that I was his friend. I respected him. I had hired him. And if he refused to make this change, I was going to fire his brother, Right. Well, yeah. And, he, and, he, and we changed it a little bit. And you know, and everything. And I, I guess uh, we remain friends more or less. You know, <laughs> like that. Guru was a but he was a wild man. Yeah. You know, oh my God. So so you got up on that, Roy, uh, when you read a Gerber book, I was always amazed by his superior vernacular. And so sometimes I'd have to have a thesaurus and a dictionary because I was like, what in the hell is he talking about? Because, you know, and I would always be educated by, you know, was he really that smart? Oh, sure. We were all that smart. <laughs> <laughs> and Steve was as smart as any of us, you know? Yeah. And, you know, he'd been, a, I think he I might have been a teacher for a little bit too, but, you know, he's working advertising with words. He'd been reading comic books and everything else. I mean, you know, he was just, probably had a better, you know, formal education like, than I did or whatever. He, he was very smart. Though, though he Maybe was, he had a little less sense about what words to use. I think the rest of us knew those words too. Maybe we didn't. We knew enough not to maybe use quite as many of them to say <laughs> unless we were writing the beast. Otto, you got something? I do. I do. So <laughs> um, I would love to know the when well, I've talked about this before. Um, the Sanctum Santorum. Am I saying that properly, Roy? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. The address. What was the address? One seventy seven A Bleecker Street. Bleecker Street. And who was yeah. your roommate at the time? Who did? Was that well, officially my roommate was on red controls? We learned uh, was uh, Gary Friedrich. Gotcha. Okay. Um, unofficially, a, a couple a week or two after we uh, moved into that Greenwich Village apartment, it was yes. on Bleecker Street between McDougal and Sullivan. It's right in the heart of the village. This, I mean, yes. this is really it. You know, it was the second floor, right above some sort of weird parlor they had there at the time, where it was it was like it looked like a, a bump, uh, like a um, cotton candy machine and people stuck their hands in it. They got ink uh, paint on it. And then they did canvases. It was some stupid sixties thing. We're talking yeah, about okay. 65, 66, you know, so I could do it, it didn't last long, but it was down there and there were motorcycles revving up all the time. Maybe that's where Gary got the idea. No, he rode a motorcycle occasionally. He didn't try it. He didn't own one, but he rode one. But anyway, and we'd been there a couple of weeks and suddenly Saul Brodsky comes up to me at the, uh, 
and introduces me to yet another person. He'd already introduced me a couple weeks after I got there to John Romita, who was almost faded when he realized that I read his Captain America comics and remembered them. And I met Bill Everett. And of course, that was a big thrill to meet the creator of Submariner, a character that, you know, he'd actually even created the character. And I loved his work, especially his work in the 50s, when you know, and so forth. And when I read it later, his uh, his work in the late 30s and early 40s. And uh, so, you know, and Saul Brodsky says to me, Bill lives up in Massachusetts, but he's going to be down here three or four nights a week, you know, go home for weekends, that kind of thing. And he needs a place to stay. So, he's, oh, so he sort of pushed me, you know, and it wasn't that hard. I mean, here's the creator of the Submariner. We have this apartment, uh, you know, it was like a shotgun apartment. It's a room in the front and there's a kitchen and then there's another room, you know, the shotgun apartment, you know, that means if you stand at one end and you shoot through, you'll go through and not hit any walls you know, or anything like that, you know, and uh, just the three or four rooms there, not big and certainly not plush by any means. So Bill would come there and, you know, uh, three or four nights a week and so forth. He, and crush. He had, and, and, well, he, he basically lived there. I mean, unofficially because, you know, he wasn't on the, he wasn't on the lease. Now, and, now uh, if you think he and Gary became drinking buddies and it, he, he drew, he, he was drawing Submariner. He was drawing that first panel he did of Submariner, the splash page with a street scene. That looked just like outside our window, except for Dr. Strange being. Yeah. There. And you know, what's funny. If you think about the Sanctum Santorum and like what that means in the Marvel universe. Yes. The real life was even better. I yes, mean, that's why I that. love talking about it. Uh, Mr. It's Roy, it's quite it's as big. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. And I wanted to say, did you have the large staircase in there? But no, that's okay. No, and, really you know, I have thing. it doesn't exist so. anymore, of course. They took the door, it still exists, but it's but where the that painting place was 177 Bleecker Street. Yeah. Our address, which was a three or four store, you know, walk up. We were on the second floor. Yes. No elevator, nothing like that, you know. It, it was uh Great. that was 177A. Now they both say 177. There is no more. So you can't find 177A. You can't go back to either 177A, Bleecker Street, or Constantinople because they don't exist anymore. Or maybe they do exist, but yeah. not in this plane yeah. of reality. Yeah, yeah so, right, right. And, and of course, Absolutely. what happened was that, uh, you know, near the end of the Doctor Strange run, I I need I was having him get a new secret identity, you know, to become suddenly Steven Sanders. You know, it's the kind of thing they do in the new Spider-Man movie, really. It, I was wondering if somebody, you know, it's almost the same thing where, uh, you know, Doctor Strange got eternity to, uh, you know, change it so that everybody, you know, suddenly knew him as Stephen Strange. It was really almost the same kind of thing in a way. Oh my but God. anyway, I needed, and I'd had a, a telegram arrive earlier addressed to Stephen Strange at 177A, you know, at some of the, I didn't want to just fake it and not have an address. So I figured, well, you know, we didn't live there anymore. It wasn't going to hurt us. So I just wrote it. <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh, my goodness. Maybe I shouldn't. We could have gotten in trouble. Can but. you? And then so it's that became crazy. famous as the address of Dr. Strange. And it's kind of funny because, as I said, Bill Everett, I had written Dr. Strange. Gary never did, but I had written Dr. Strange and a couple with Ditko and Wood again. And, uh, or, and uh, you know, Bill Everett, of course, was drawing Dr. Strange at that time. So it was, it was an appropriate thing crazy. to do. Crazy, wow, crazy. Go crazy. ahead, Steve. Crazy life. All right, Roy. Um, I want to delve into something which is actually quite controversial. Uh oh! And, uh, I didn't do it. I'm this is our be... annual episode. I... Go for it, Steve. Go for it. Um, I want to get some validation and some correction on some stuff that's been going on these last couple of years, and because you uh you were there and you can uh, answer these questions. Uh, about a year ago, I got into quite a debate with someone online who was utterly convinced that Stanley had done no writing. OK, and what he did was he just yeah. would say to someone, OK, here's an idea. I want A and B to fight. Go ahead and do it. And the writer and the artist would do it all. Mm -hmm. And I got into, you know, quite a debate. And the example that I gave was the Silver Surfer series, which, you know, a series that was very close to Stan's heart. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like he poured everything into the into the story and the reply i got was well we've never seen any scripts now can <laughs> you them please, away. <laughs> can you i don't please, have any scripts either we threw them away can oh. you please confirm okay for everyone that's watching right now okay including mr alan moore if he's watching yeah. okay uh that Stan actually did do some sort of typing, some sort of work, some guidance for the artist oh. to work. Well, for Alan Moore is one of the great comic writers of our time. He's not stupid enough to believe this, is he? 
Yeah. No, he doesn't believe that Stan did anything. Yeah. Really? Oh, well, then he's full of crap, you know. <laughs> uh, good writer as he is, he's still full of crap. You could be brilliant and still be stupid and wrong. No, uh, Stan wrote a lot. I mean, you know, I mean, we we just have those couple of examples of pages, you know, from a Fantastic Four plot. Also, what a, is he saying that he just didn't write a plot or because he obviously wrote a script? I saw no, many, many there are that people out there that say that Stan didn't do anything. Well, there was a rumor at one time that Artie Simic was doing it all because Stan's name was on so many books that some people said, I bet Artie Simic the letterer is right. Some of the stupid, there were stupid people with all, all degrees of IQ, you know, and everything. And they can believe all kinds of crazy things, you know. And, 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 and stupid uh, biographies. I mean, too. it's not it's not that Stan oh. eventually didn't do less and less plot writing. Because, you know, he had more, a lot to do. He was getting involved with other things. Uh, he was, you know, he was increasingly called on for, you know, some of it was a little, little personal appearance in the early days, but this is way before that because he wasn't doing that much of that then. But he was busy enough that, and he had, he had these brilliant uh, collaborators. I mean, Jack Kirby was, you know, a, a genius in his own way there, you know, for sure. And Steve Ditko, while you wouldn't have necessarily thought it before, all of a sudden, you know, he suddenly, I, I never saw it before and I never saw it after, quite frankly, I, you know, with Steve's work. But to, for, to me, for those few years he was doing Spider-Man and Doctor Strange, except for, you know, a little bit of the Captain Adam before, you know, I'm, I've never been that impressed with Steve Ditko's work. You know, I mean, it's it's always been good. But I mean, his concepts, the Creeper and Hawk and the Dove, you know, I'm never going to get interested in that stuff or anything else he did. But his Doctor Strange and his uh, Spider-Man were just brilliant. And you know, he had some other good collaborators, Dick Ayers and Heck, they could kind of carry through. So Stan knew what these guys could do. He didn't hire people who weren't good storytellers. He didn't want somebody who, who needed, you know, A and B. And here he had, he, he stumbled into it. It was just all stuff coming together, you know, that I could tell when I got there, you know, you could easily deconstruct how it had happened. I mean, Stan was just busy. So he has, so next, so he lets Jack do a lot of the work. Now, I know Jack at the time didn't really mind because Jack was, you know, had been kicked out of D.C. and he was very happy making a living when he'd been blackballed by the biggest company in the world, uh, you know, in comics and so forth. So and uh, Ditko, they wouldn't have cared to hire Ditko in that day and age, probably, you know, let our, our hacker heirs. They weren't giving these guys any job offers, you know, and uh, they hadn't wanted Bill Everett when uh, time we had collapsed before, particularly, which is why Bill left the field. Uh, you know, Marvel was just a bunch of, uh, you know, misfits and, and leftovers. I mean, I was, sort of my, I was sort of one myself in a way being thrown out at DC. And, uh, you know, so Stan, yeah, he, he got, he let Jack do a lot because Jack could do a lot. And, you know, I agree that Jack should have eventually got more money for it, but that's more between him and the publisher than Stan. Stan didn't own the company. He didn't own the characters. Maybe he could have done more for Jack. Maybe he couldn't have, you know, and everything. I certainly, you know, I, I know he did what he felt he could. Maybe he didn't try hard enough. I don't know. You know, certainly he was not. Stan had a lot of blind spots, <laughs> you know, with all his talent. We all do. Stan, some of Stan's were that he somehow thought that, you know, he could sort of, that if he had a little conversation with somebody, he could straighten it out, you know, so that when. Jack got really upset about that article in the the article in the uh, Herald Tribune that came out that it you know that came out in January of '66 had been a few weeks before, and he talked to Jack and 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 Roz on the phone and he thinks he's got it all straightened out and he just didn't ever recognize you know that it was still going to fester you know and everything I mean so that while Stan could handle those worlds he wasn't always as skillful a master of people as he as he thought he was and. Because in order to keep Jack happy, you'd have probably had to give him a little bit more. Because the problem wasn't really Stan, though. The real problem in original days was Martin Goodman. Martin Goodman had no concept at all that any artist was important. Really? Yeah. I mean, you know, he, he when he hired Joe Simon in 1940. Yeah. 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 To be the editor, he didn't hire Simon and Kirby, who were already a team, right? Right. He didn't hire them. They were a team established. All their their byline, Stanley. I mean. Uh, Jack Kirby, Joe Simon, Jack Kirby, he hired Joe Simon. Joe Simon brought Jack along because and and forced Goodman to give him a staff job. Goodman just did it, you know, because ah, you know, he's just an artist. He's his buddy and he's an artist, but you know, Goodman wow. didn't see anything much in artists. He felt like I won't say he thought they were necessarily totally in, interchangeable. I mean, he knew Jack was you know better than others. He knew the books of that, but 
you know, as far as he was concerned, if he had Stan as the editor and the writer, he was in good shape. And he was worried about that. I mean, he he didn't like the idea that Stan was writing all the books. That's why he got that one guy, what's his name, Harry Lazarus? No, Leon, Leon Lazarus, to write one story. Leon Lazarus wrote for all the men's magazines and things like that. And he got him because he felt he was too dependent on Stan. He said, he told Lazarus, he said, I want you to go in and write some stories for Stan. If Stan gets hit by a truck, you know, I got, I, I suddenly don't have a writer, you know. And uh, Leon wrote one story, didn't like it and gave up, you know. But, and he, but he, so he sort of understood that Stan was important and, and Perfect Film made him understand it because they wouldn't buy the company from him for what was it, 13 or 14 million dollars, unless he got Stan to sign a contract to stay. So he knew Stan was important, but they, but he, but see, Perfect Film hadn't said you got to also hire Kirby. And so Ed Goodman wasn't going to, and Stan just looking out for himself. You know, he, he'll look out for Jack when everything's going. He looks out for Jack, and Jack got raises. He always had his higher, higher rate than anybody at Marvel. Uh, but somehow or other, you know, this between, well, you know, the, the one thing I always say, the one thing you know about in any partnership is that each part each, each partner did 90% of the work. <laughs> and if you don't believe it, just ask him, you know. And uh, I think Stan gave Jack more credit than Jack gave Stan, but each of them, you know, I mean, you know, they they sort of felt like, you know, they were a couple absolutes there, you, you know. can always know. It's like when when Jack Kirby was without Stan, he never he never achieved that type well, of greatness. Some people would think, you know, I mean, the new gods was no, a no, nice concept. Yeah, but not like at the, the time. Writing, but... Not at the time. Yeah. Today they look back. Yeah, but at the time, no, even, even then there were a lot of people. I mean, I, they didn't sell that well. Well, you know, but, you know, but the thing is that uh, they, you know, but people recognize that Jack, you know, had, you know, that he was, Jack was coming up with, my feeling is that Jack would not have come up with that kind of thing if he hadn't also been working with Stan for the preceding decade, you know, and so it, it they, they, they were really much more in a symbiotic relationship than either one of them wanted to recognize. Stan liked to think that he was totally independent, and he did manage to do a lot of stuff without Jack. He could sell comics with Dick Ayers. He could sell comics with Steve Ditko, who knew that you know was going to happen, right? Who knew that Spider-Man was going to become more popular than the Fantastic Four, you know? Wow. My thing about Stan Lee and Steve Dick, I mean, uh, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, it's that I think a lot... First, a lot of it has become mythalized, and it's all this, mm -hmm. and everybody tries to interpret things. But I think the biggest gripe, especially for the Kirby fans, is that Stanley lived. I'm a Kirby fan. No, no, but but <laughs> we we were talking about this the other day. Stanley lived longer. He became more of this larger than life character. He got to enjoy these co creations and all that. Kirby never did. He died in '94. What did he get? The X Men cartoon. So I mean, like, there's still that like animosity yeah. there, and then. And Stan is getting all this adulation because of all these movies and all this stuff. And he's there in it that Jack didn't get yeah. it. But I believe if Kirby was still alive, he was a lot older than Stan, too. Several years. Several years. Right? Yeah. He would have gotten those cameos, too. I believe he would have yeah. been there, too, in that. But, I, but I, I think I think Stan would have, you know, I think people would have offered it to him. Even if Stan yeah. hadn't done it, people would have offered it to him. Because I'll tell you, maybe Martin Goodman didn't understand Jack Kirby's value. So, maybe... Perfect film and chemical slash cadence didn't understand Jack Kirby's value. But the kind of people who started making movies in the last two or three decades about Marvel, they understood Jack Kirby's value. You know, yeah. uh, maybe not some of the people that did the first Spider Man and X Men because Spider Man wasn't really a Kirby character and X Men was really based more on the Claremont and, and those guys and yeah, so the, forth. But, you know, when once, but once you had uh, Marvel Studios going, all those guys, you know, the, uh, the people there, you know, the, Ke the the Kevin Feige's and the people like that, you know, they they knew Jack Kirby's value uh, independently of Stan. And uh, it would have been nice to see Stan and Jack together in something, but Jack just didn't live long enough. Now, granted, Stan was I, 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 I really liked the man. Sometimes I almost loved him. But, you know, he he looked out for number one and he sometimes forgot who number two might be, <laughs> you know, and everything. But then. Who's to say Jack was no angel? I mean, I'm not gonna stand there and tell bad stories about Jack, but Jack was no angel. So I know I knew a couple of underhanded things that he did too, you know, but not the worst things in the world. But you know, he was not neither of these guys were angels. They were just we were just all a bunch of people trying to make a living. And sometimes they did things right and smart, and sometimes they did something stupid, and sometimes it was venal. And and they know? were they were people, they were real people. And the thing is, today it's so mythologized that you've got writers now. 
they have no say in anything. They're writing books. It's easy to print a book now and put it out. You got people doing that Jack Kirby book. You got those freaks for Kirby. Stan did nothing. And then you got the people that hate Stan. And they you got the, like like that one of some of these biographies. They never they met Stan at a at a at a, at a convention and they signed that. And then all of a sudden they know his whole life and all. But that's what. Yeah, you but get. I think the main thing here is if we want to bring it full circle, is that Roy, you saw these scripts right. I mean, can, I, I mean, I'm I'm dying that he threw them away because well, can you I, imagine I didn't how much see those the plots, plots I didn't see the plots very often, and some of those increasingly did become like just conversations over the phone and things like that, you know. And and sometimes and, and a lot of times it was with a lot of the a lot of the artists besides well Steve left, left very soon, but uh, the other artists Stan, what little he was doing, likely with a Gene Cole, and he was still writing out scripts at least by you know after i was there because i remember a conversation i was in the room hearing part of it <laughs> yeah. and uh he, he was very upset there's a i forget I, I put it in alter ego there was there was a story you know there was a iron man was a 12 chap a 12 page story at the beginning of tales of suspense mm -hmm. and jack so stan had sent him a plot you know uh, it was like i don't know two three four pages you know whatever like that single spaced and so forth you know for a 12 page story and it, but it had all, you know, it had all the broad strokes in it. And, you know, that was, the, that was the period when Gene was taking a whole page to open a door that Stan would complain about. He said, you open it beautifully, but it's a door, you know? And uh, so, and so, and so uh, Gene gets to like the, near the end of the 10 page story or so. And he, and, he, and, he, and Stan, and he, I guess he sent some of it in so that Stan saw it. He says, you know, you're, you're, says you're, you're taking up so much space with these big panels. You have a panel to open a door. And it's a dramatic panel, but aren't you going to run out of the room? What about this stuff that happens, you know, uh, near, near the end? And Gene says, I haven't read that far yet. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he hadn't bothered to read the whole plot. So he's just drawing along, not even thinking about the fact he's got 12 pages. And when he gets to page eight and he's only on page one, it never even occurred oh to him. So all of a sudden you've got this one story. It's one where Iron Man has to fly up and there's a rocket and explodes. And there's like this 12 page last phase <laughs> that she drew. And Stan had to just kill himself to write it to make it make sense <laughs> because it was such a, a hasty ending. You know, and Gene, Gene was just like that. You know, he, you know, he, uh, he just, you know, he got better as he went along, but this was like still in the early but, first year. Or two. But but see, this explains my point. They were they were human. They were, and, and now they're so mythologized. We see them as these larger than life gods, and like people don't realize Kirby wasn't perfect either. Steve Dicko mm -hmm. wasn't perfect either. Hey, Roy Thomas is alive here in the flesh. I'm he perfect, but, you know, yeah. but, these but I'm guys, just, I don't know but about. I'm just saying though, because we look at these stories and they mean so much to so many people that now all of a sudden they they're yeah. in legend now. They're not, but they were real people. They, they weren't, yeah. and they didn't do everything that they think that they wanted them to do. I've and heard Leonardo da Vinci was a lousy dinner guest. You know, I've heard lots of stories, <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, you know, but Stan. First of all, I saw endless pages of actual script as far as dialogue and that stuff because you know that went through our office we saw it the other stuff would have been uh, if it was written out and it decreasingly was probably uh but it remember ditko of course had plotted his own stuff and and stan and ramita would just talk it over at the office he'd call ramita in the, into his room and ramita would sit there and take notes but he's taking notes on what stan wanted to do and what ramita wanted to do those are really you know stories that are co-plotted and everything and uh you know and uh, once or twice, I remember Stan had near the beginning, right after Ditko left in sixty, uh, at the beginning of '66, around there, he called me in when he and when he and Ramita were going to plot out not just the next issue, but sort of which direction the strip was going to take for months, because Stan had had a year or so of not controlling Spider-Man's direction, just mm -hmm. reacting to whatever Steve did, and he liked it and he didn't like it, you know, at the same time, you know, uh, because he had they had different ideas, he just went along with it because it was better than fighting with Steve. And so I'm sitting there, you know, just what, and I, and Stan saw me and said, so you've got a strange look on your face, right? What, what is this? I says, well, I'm just thinking, you know, this idea, you're thinking about where things are going and you're doing this and that. I said, you know, that's not the way I thought of comics, you know, usually being done in the past, you know, and everything. And uh, he, he said, well, you know, we just have to, wanted to figure it out. The funny thing is I never liked to do that myself. I always did it by the seat of my past, just like Stan did his best days, but you know, they, they had to get, figure out where they were going to go after Ditko left, you know. But he, and I didn't see a lot of uh, of writing, of plots, 
There was less and less of it, but I know that he was still writing them for Gene Colan. Uh, I don't think he did them for Dick Ayers when he was writing, uh, you know, uh, when he was doing Sergeant Fury with him. In fact, you know, Dick made up one or two of those stories practically from scratch. He tells about how Stan wouldn't give him a, he was upset because Stan wouldn't give him a plotting credit or something on it. And Stan but I can't imagine it. John, I can't imagine John Basema coming up and, and, you know, telling, you know, Stan, I've got great ideas for the surfer. Oh, no, he never did. No, no, they were all Stan's ideas. Now, that doesn't mean that that uh, John didn't, you know, wasn't given a broad thing and he filled in a lot of the details. He was given something that could have made a 10-page story and that his job was to stretch to about 30, you know. But he did it with beautiful panels and Stan knew yes, he was with that. the best panels. panels. And I doubt if there was anything written. There could have been something written for John occasionally. I used to write plots for John most of the time. But, uh, but Stan, I think, probably didn't most of the time because, you know, he just didn't want to. He didn't feel he needed to anymore. And once John was doing, once Stan had seen John and didn't like his first couple of stories from Marvel, like that Hulk and so forth, and had him uh, work over Kirby layouts a time or two, and then toss, and he didn't, do you remember, Stan didn't begin working with uh, Busema right away, even though he was this wonderful draftsman. He threw him to me. He said, he's your new uh, artist on uh, Avengers while Don Heck was off drawing an annual and so forth. You know, I didn't have any choice. I, well, it turns out I didn't want a choice. It was, I saw his work, you know, and, and as soon as John, he got really good, then Stan grabbed him back away from the Avengers, <laughs> you know, silver server. So, you know, but I, I didn't, but John just, you know, developed in his own way. And, and actually Stan, you know, Stan really did things that, you know, in some ways hurt and infuriated John so that he hated Stan for the rest of his life, you know. That experience over Silver Surfer number four. I was John, just before John you go, remembered yes. that to the end of his day. I was just going to ask him that. We were going to go because you were talking about John Buscema. Roy, I, I, most collectors know and most people love art. Silver Surfer number four is one of the greatest, like, single comics ever. One of the greatest covers ever. Mm -hmm. Inside, it's just so immaculately beautiful. beautiful. And the genius of Stan Lee or whatever, this is where not we apparent came, that day. right, not apparent that day. <laughs> Tell us the story of Silver Surfer number four in uh, okay. through the eyes. Well, of, of course, Stan what, I, Lee. what I know is, well, of course, I didn't see it through Stan's eyes or Jaws. What I saw was I'm sitting in, in the office and John comes in. I, I don't think I necessarily knew that they were doing a story with Thor in it, you know, which Silver Surfer goes to Asgard and all that, but John brings it in. And I guess Saul Brodsky was still, but, but, you know, John Reporton was probably working there, John Romita, you know, we were, we were fans of John's stuff and we had loved what he was doing on Silver Surfer. It, you know, remember the preceding issue at Mephisto had been lovely too. Right. And, oh, uh, crazy. uh, you know, so he brings in this job and with, people would want to look over Kirby's if it's Kirby, but Kirby would usually just, when he was there, would, would have gone directly in the stand. But, you know, with Biosilva, his work was so good. He wasn't doing Kirby type work yet. He, he was doing enough of it, but he had his own style, you know, and so forth. You, you, you wouldn't have confused it with imitation Kirby like you would have a, uh, a little later. So he brings in this job and we all want to see it. John doesn't resist that, you know, and so forth. He wasn't pushing it. And, we, and you know, to say, you know, that it, it, it wasn't exactly an orgasmic experience, but it's somewhere getting up there. I mean, we just <laughs> thought it was just the most beautiful stuff. Stan kind of comes out. I, I think he saw us all kind of, you know, looking at it, being so impressed. And this, this is an account. When, as it happens, by a weird coincidence, it was it wasn't that. It was either that night or the next night. I had we had a meeting at Gil Kane's studio apartment in the city. John Buscema and I, Archie Goodwin and Gil and Gray Morrow. We were thinking of doing some kind of book with three different features in it. I was going to work with John, Archie with Gil, and. You know, and, and Gray was good to his Orion character. I don't remember what, but it never went out. They think I don't know if Stan would have raised the roof or whatever. But anyway, so this is just a day or so after. So I heard this story was very fresh in John's mind. And he was and he was just so livid. And he was swearing, you know, uh, under and over his breath about Stan, you know, and so forth. And how he'd like to kill him, you know, things like that. Little, little details. And he says, uh, and I said, I said, well, what happened? And I said, well, he says, I went into, I go into Stan's. And Stan takes the pages and looks over, you know, for a couple of seconds, flips through them and so forth, you know, because I mean, he knew John could draw like nobody's business, no question about that. And he said, uh, he says, forget everything those guys out there told you. He said, this is all wrong. <laughs> you know, and he says, and I'll tell you why. And he proceeded to go over it. And the funny thing is, I don't think he had anything changed 
But what it was is John had done his own kind of version of Asgard, and it had a little more of an Arthurian look to it. It's a, it's not quite the straight Kirby Asgard, you know. It's is a little more yeah. down to earth, but it looks it's Asgard, but it's an Arthurian oh. kind of Asgard. <laughs> anyway, and Stan, that and certain other things, I don't know exactly what all it was. I know oh. that was part of it. Anyway, but he went over the whole job for like a half an hour or so, and he really demoralized the hell out. And that was the end of of. I never heard John say another kind word about Stan between no, 1968 or 69, whatever that was, and when he died in 2000. Oh or so. I never, whenever I ever saw him, he'd never say anything. Really about quick, Stan. can you imagine looking at those pages and then say like raw, brand new, yeah. and saying like, "Yeah, this is not." Forget what work. they told you; it's all raw. Oh, oh my yeah. god! Anyway, so he came out and he and he just, you know, he he was he was livid. He felt sta- he he said he felt Stan had totally just. Dist- destroyed his confidence. That's why I'm telling you that while Stan was like one of the great, he really was one of the great editors of comics, uh, but maybe I think he was a great editor party because he was also the writer, you know, and so forth. Whether he had been a great editor when he wasn't also a writer, I don't know, but he certainly, you know, but he he really messed up with Buscema because there was no necessity to make John Buscema hate you for the rest of his life, <laughs> you know, over, over a comic book story, uh, especially when you, when, when Stan knew how well it was drawn and he published it as far as if, if there were changes made, there weren't that many because it still has the same kind of Arthurian look and everything. He didn't make him redraw a huge amount of it. It was more like for the future, you know, kind of thing. Wow. And it was just a mistake on Stan's part. But, the, but the, of course, the aftermath of the thing is that a few years later, five, ten years later, when – I, what they republished it. Was it one of the Simon and Schuster books? That yeah, yeah. It was in the Marvel Masterworks. Marvel Masterworks. Yeah, and, and I guess uh, – Huh? What was it? It was in the Marvel Masterworks. Yeah. No, no, but well, I think but in the, before the Simon, the Marvel's greatest superhero battles. Yeah, I think it, it was. Yeah, it was. It was. That's when they first before that. This was in the seventies. Yeah, and uh, at that time, where I first saw yeah, it. That's at where at I that first time, saw. Stan, evidently, I don't know if he was in person. I think it called him up, but again, John told me about this later during a conversation, and said that he called him up and said, uh, "I uh, said that, uh, but God, that." That story that I was looking again over that story. I said, you know, that's one of the greatest things you ever did, you know. And and oh. John said, you know, John just look at me, he says, I wanted to throw him out the fucking window. He said, you know, <laughs> and John was big enough to do it, even though Stan was he he just and the thing is, Stan had no memory at all, you know, that if I don't know if John if if John said anything at all, but he would not have got Stan to believe that he had ever said those things about the story and that he hadn't thought it was the greatest thing in the world. Oh. But everybody else who was there at Marvel the day that came in remembered that story, not just John DeSimba, but myself. And I'm sure if you had asked Marie Severin or the other, or a couple of other people there at the office, John Report, you know, they, they would have told you, you know, the same thing, except they didn't talk to John DeSimba about it as much as I did. But, you know, these, these things just happen. You know, you something goes wrong and all of a sudden two people, and it always amazed me that Stan, did such great collaborative work with guys, Wally Wood, Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, John Buscema, all of whom hated him. <laughs> you know? And it wasn't just over stealing credit. I mean, John Buscema was very upset later over the how to draw comics the Marvel way because the original contract sort of called for it to be like Stan's book that John just happened to be drawing, you know, and he had to demand a re. re- so Stan sometimes was looking out for himself a little bit too much at the expense of others. But, you know, on the other hand, hey, it's everybody's job to look out for themselves. John did. He got the right credit he deserved on the book, you know. But he, but regardless of the hate, though, Stan brought out, some, in some yeah, way, sure. he brought greatness out of people. Mm-hmm. Like, whether it was through anger or frustration or what. Everybody remember all the great work uh, John Buscema did before he came to Marvel in comics? I mean, there's nothing pretty, he did nice work, but there's nothing memorable. Particularly. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the greatest example, of course, is if you take a look at Strange Tales 150, you take a look at his art mm. and his first work, really, at Marvel. And well, it's actually you know, kind of, the Kirby breakdowns, you mean? Or, yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah, it's actually, it's actually quite wooden. It's actually quite wooden. Quite, you know, it's just not there. Yeah. Well, he had However, been in advertising for a year. And one of the things about advertising uh, is that they, you know, they tr- it, it's such a different style that they, they took what he might have had at one time and took it out of it. It's sort of like when George Tuska came in and started drawing Iron Man. Yeah, and Stan would talk to him about the excitement and doing this and this, and, and George looked at him and says, because he'd been drawing Buck Rogers as a newspaper strip for a decade or so, and he said, Stan says, what you're telling me to do is everything that the syndicate 
has spent the last 20 years telling me not to do, you know, he says, well, that's them. This is me, you know, and that's, that's the thing, you know, uh, it's just different standards and so forth, you know, that, uh, what's, what's sad about it to me is because I had worked with John before on Avengers and loved his work is that John, as a result, almost directly, at least largely, if not totally, as a result of that Silver Surfer number four experience, decided to become a Kirby clone. And his work changes almost immediately. It still has the one, the same wonderful, good drawings. Uh, but from then on, there was uh, maybe a little less when he got to Conan and a few things. But it, from then on, his superhero work is doesn't have that kind of grandeur and and independent individual feel that his Avengers say and his Submariner that 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 I did. And then then the first and maybe the first three or four issues of uh, Silver Surfer. You know, yes, Sam I mean, never got the, another uh, good a job out of him again after Silver Surfer number four. The rest of the Silver Surfer stuff that, he, that John did was reflecting that, and it wasn't as good. Yes, and I think obviously, if there's anyone, <laughs> there's no one more perfect to uh, answer this question or to speak to it. Is you know when he took over when he, you know on uh, issue forty one of Avengers, you know mm -hmm. it, it's good work, but by the time you get to issue fifty, mm -hmm. he is. Flowing. I mean, I can't even imagine when you saw those finished pages what you were thinking. I mean, it, yeah. I mean, talk about a transition. And yes, Steve, that work that he did on the Avengers and the Submariners and, the, and those first issues of Silver Surfer, that's the height, yeah. I think, of yeah. comic storytelling. It's the height. I think the Submariner might even be better than the Avengers in some ways. Or at least, Steve, I just or at least have to have this loaded, Steve. Check this out. Wow. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, the thing is, I think he had seen, and I'd probably sent him that first splash page by Simon and Kirby, in which has a not dissimilar pose, you know, and everything. Not not specifically for the cover, but when he was doing the story, so that may reflect it. But it has his own feel. For example, one of the things I love about that, for the inside, and then it's reflected on the cover, is that he doesn't. It was all his idea to have that. One little thing, he's still kind of a muscle man, though a leaner, slightly leaner muscle man. He doesn't have that kind of feel, but he's got that cape, which not many characters had anymore. Uh, and but he doesn't just flow it, you know, he once in a while he'll kind of hold it, so you know, so it almost seems as so it's almost like alive. like drapery or something, and it's it becomes a you know more of a part of it than just something hanging around behind him. And that was entirely John's instinct, you know, that this was a different kind of character, but it, it became such a visual part of the character, and other people followed through on it. John had a really good sense. Uh, we always used to say uh, when Hal Foster retired, John DeSimmons should take over Prince Valiant and give it some guts, you know. And, and it was funny that about when John did issue number four of the Silver Surfer, I never thought Ke uh, Thor's cape looked better. That mm. issue, for some reason, like even when he's on the ground and it's mm. just so magnificent, so majestic. Yeah. That's the word yeah. for it. Like I never saw a cape yeah. like that. And so doing yeah. with the vision yeah. stuff, it's yeah, I was I was very like I worked so talented with so talented. two at, at at the time when they were doing I feel what was their best work. Two of the uh, I was lucky enough to work with two of the very best artists I feel that the comics have produced, which was uh, you know John Buscema and Neil Adams. You know. Oh wow! Okay, yeah, that's true. Uh, okay, the, uh, uh, Chris Scrollwall. Mm -hmm. Oh, my I God. mean, it's amazing. You get Neil Adams, and then you get a fill-in issue or the ending of it by John Basema, and he yeah. is drawing. He's drawing outside of himself. I mean, I was thinking uh, in my mind. I don't know whether this is true. That John's like, oh, so Neil's pretty good, huh? But you haven't seen me. You yeah, know? <laughs> well, I don't know, but I, I will. But I do know one thing. You know, he uh, John had just a few days to do. Well, it, it was probably rougher pencils, and Tom Palmer had to add a little to it. But, but. Uh, you know, there there was such a problem with the uh, deadline on that book. You know, Neil did start it, but by that time, I'd ha uh, there had been pressure on me that I had to have John Buscema do it. I didn't want to, but I, I sort of had to. John Reporton, you know, as a production manager, said, you know, we can't wait for Neil anymore. When Neil walked in with pages, I said, I'm sorry, I can't take them. And because uh, I'd had to call John. And remember, here's John picking up a story, except for that little chapter. He knew nothing about the story. I don't know if I had time to send him that much of it. Maybe he got it. He had to draw it in a, in a few days, really. It was really super fast. And then it had to be shipped out to uh, to Tom Palmer, who, uh, you know, who was just really upset. You know, at one stage, 
was that the time that he said that he was never going to go to eat Neil because he says, I've spent the last time staying up all night because Neil can't make a deadline. Of course, he probably did. <laughs> but, you know, but the thing was, of course, Neil's work was so superlative and everything. And John, John did a really good job. But, you know, he, in his case, he's, he's drawing, he's drawing it just, you know, just real fast. I don't think he had time to think too much about what he was doing. Well, okay. As we know, this is our, uh, our annual. We're going a little late How here. How do you have an annual? You've been on three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 12 weeks. 12 weeks. 12, 12 weeks. weeks. That's, it's, so, it's a quarterly is what it is. That's a true know. editor right there. That's yeah. a true editor. <laughs> and how can you, an and annual. the editor-in-chief. So how Yes, can you exactly. Can wait till issue uh, 36 or something. Obviously, we're now. always going to have Roy back. He's our mascot. No, but, no, but, before, but, be before, but before we go, I first off, I want to say, what an interesting life. If there's anybody that needs to tell their own autobiography, it's Roy Thomas. I mean, like, he was just in the, the greatest moments in comics from being a fan all the way up. But I want to do something a little fun, though. Guys, uh, Roy, you've never done this before, and you, this will be kind of entertaining. We're gonna, I'm going to say a name. You can give me a, one word or a quick little quip Ooh, about them. Good at this, okay? Right. No, just one word. and Just with Eddie Creator. First, we'll start from the top. Steve, Is it okay with you, Steve? <laughs> oh sure, I'm. I'm all go right, ahead. All right, all right. Steve, Steve show too, you know. Steve Ditko. And these are supposed to be quick. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. Good, I'm not good at that. I'm, I'm awful at Wordle. It takes five hours to do that. You know. So Steve Ditko. Steve Ditko. Odd. Odd. Okay. Steve Gerber. Crazy. <laughs> Jack Kirby. Brilliant. John Buscema. Fantastic. I don't know. <laughs> Sal Busema. Very good. Sol Brodsky. Mm. Efficient. Efficient. Marie Sever. A delight. That's oh, two words okay. Still. Whoa. Even though she wouldn't speak to me once for six months, you know, still, or three months or whatever it was. Her but, brother, uh, Steve. John. Oh, John. Excuse me. Yes. I didn't know John very well, uh, but what's another word for brilliant? <laughs> Great. I don't know. Great. Tom Palmer. It, uh, marvelous anchor. I, I need two words there. All right. Let's get a little more. Neil Adams. Of all the words I said about everybody else that were good. Well, let, well, me, uh, <laughs> let me throw in a couple of names. Go, okay. go, go. Sure. Jerry Conway. Super facile. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. Marv Wolfman. Mm, solid. Jim Shooter. Next. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Paul. I can say such wonderful good things and wonderful bad things, but, you know, he's uh, tall. Uh, I, I, I look, I, I just try to think of the word it to be determined. Love it. Determined. That's determined. That would be one way. There's better words, but that'll, that'll do it. And I don't, okay, mean, then that, I have, and I don't uh, mean that in a bad way necessarily, you know? Yeah. And, and then I have one more, of course, Steve Engelhardt. Oh, huh, there's another it's a superlative type of word, but I don't know. Uh, Steve Engelhart. Singular. Oh. I could have said that about Steve Gerber too, probably, you know, and everything, but I think that that fits because it was that slight oddness. It was, you know. Otto, you got any names? Don't say I have the one name. name. I, I have one name. Uh, he's my favorite artist of all time. A young Otto got to meet him when he was 11 years old um, at yeah. a local comic shop, and his name is uh, Dave Cockrum. Dave Cockrum, yeah. Uh, it, did I use inventive? Inventive would be. No, uh, I love that. Thank you very much. Him well, because he was a, a pretty good draftsman. You know, yep. everything that, that, but he was very inventive, making up all these. I guess he had a Wolverine before I did too, although I don't remember it, you know. And, uh, but you know, just constantly making up all these characters that were going to be Legionnaires and they all ended up being X Men because DC was too <laughs> stupid. To put. Yes, thank yes, God. absolutely. Thank God for the stupid. I mean, you know, there were a lot of good things done by DC and I was a DC fan too, but thank God for the stupidity that allowed 
that got Jack Kirby kicked out of DC Comics, <laughs> that that uh, that that wouldn't let Dave Cochran do the things he wanted to do, so they came over to to Marvel instead. And you know, uh, the, the comics field has been shaped by uh, such mistakes and judgment. I'm sure Marvel has made some and sent them. I just the got chills over that comment. That's All right, amazing. I got one ready. Len Wein. Len Wein. Uh, Trying to think of the the word and have it used before because it's certainly going to have to be good. Uh, oh God! See, see how slow I am. But my my, <laughs> my mind's going. It would it would have to be good because he was so he was facile, you know, like like Barb. He was could could you inspire? I'm just I just can't think of the right word, but. I don't know, super capable. I don't know, and, but a little more than that because there was a there was some inspiration to to Len too. Okay, you know? the last one and last good, but not, not least, and I'm glad you guys didn't say this, Stanley. How do you wrap up Stanley? Stan oh God, Stan, masterful, masterful. Oh. Yeah. He wasn't like he knew everything, you know, but he he could master what he needed to do, and he could he could wield authority when he needed to. He didn't always do it wisely. But he got wonderful work out of people. Uh, be be nice if he had managed to, you know, to keep him able to be in the same room with him without wanting to kill him. You know, sometimes uh, even, even I went through spells of that. But on the other hand, hey, you know, who said who knows what he thought of Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko and me too? You know, I mean, he didn't talk about it, but I'm sure you know. Just think what what must Stan have felt when after Jack did the the Funky Flashman thing? I mean, I just know the explosions I saw. I don't know what was really you know, going on there, you know, <laughs> what did he think? He never talked about, you know, all the things that Wally Woods said about him after he, you know, that's another one, another like one. That. You just said one, Wally Wood. Wally Wood. God, you ran out of good phrases for people. Uh, I don't know. I always thought illuminating. There was a glow about Wally stuff, wow. you know, which, those lighting effects yeah. maybe to some extent, but just the whole thing, it, it, I, of course, I of course I like that early good early stuff that he hated so much the EC and I felt his later work even Daredevil and certainly the Thunder Age stuff that came later was just a shadow of uh, of his EC work but of course he he hated that stuff you, is there is there some kind of rule that says that artists have to hate their best stuff and denounce <laughs> their best stuff as being crap you know and, mm. and keep defending the stuff they did later that's not as good it, it's as if I thought. Like my favorite comic to write of all time was All Star Squadron. I mean, bar none, before Love Conan, it. before Avengers, a All Star Squadron. If, I could, if there was any book I could write for the rest of my life, Conan would be number two, All Star Squadron would be number one. Wow! And so, for nothing, you know, nothing else would be that close. But um, it's as if I thought that my All Star Squadron writing was like, you know, the best and most influential, and 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 you know, and the greatest thing I ever did. And I don't, you know, I mean, I think the best stuff was Conan and the Avengers, and you know, and the, the best of the Marvel work was my best writing. An All Star Squadron was okay, and I enjoyed it more, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't as good and inspired as maybe the best of my Marvel work. Maybe inspired is the right word. I was more workman like than inspired. Okay, one more, a slower guy, Jerry Bales. Jerry, well, yeah, cause he's, I don't know, um. Mentor. He was he was my wow. mentor, six seven years older than I was. But I, you know, I, I I've always been some. some I, I'm not a a person. Yeah, you know, I'm really kind of a second banana kind of character, you know, and everything really. Uh, so I was second banana to Jerry on Alter Ego, and never was trying to be anything else. I didn't want to be publisher of the book or anything like that. I was second banana to Stan, and I never really wanted to. You I would know, I would say you're more of the Captain over. Marvel Junior because even Bucky. a no 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 because even that sidekick <laughs> even that sidekick could stand on his own. Well, okay, Captain Marvel Junior isn't bad. Do I get to have sideburns like him and Elvis? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'd like to thank everybody for our for staying for our 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 twelfth issue and having Roy Thomas, a legend. Did, did we run over? And you're going to have to cut this down. We got no no. We're going to. No, this is exactly what it is, right? right? This right. is exactly what an annual is. This is the extra. But I hope, but I hope people out there understand yeah, like how how we how we interact with the with the gods with respect, but also gods. with pa with passion and love. I'm a water sprite. I don't know about you, <laughs> <laughs> but but that's what we do. So we'd like to thank everybody for watching this. Steve, got any last words? Yes, uh, Roy. Uh, 
I know you uh, watch our episodes. And in a future episode, I'm going to be doing a spotlight, by the way. Okay. Ooh. When you came back, I'm going to be doing a spotlight on one of the most fantastic Thor epics ever done. I just want to give you fair warning. It's going to be a 75 hour ep uh, episode. Is that okay, Otto? Is that the Eternals yeah. thing? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I like that. I like the one with. Uh, I preferred the one with uh, Red Narvo becoming Thor even more, but I, yes. I, did, I did have fun with the Eternals. Marvel asked me to, you know, to bring the Eternals into the Marvel universe, and stay, since Jack had tried so hard to keep it out, and they wanted to bring it in, so that was that was my response to it. I had fun doing it. Yes. Well, what you're going to get to see me slather over those issues at some point in the future. Um, again, it's been an utter pleasure, and I think we really got into some great stuff uh, in this annual. And uh, I really do look forward to seeing you come back again because we haven't even and don't give them the my address. All the Kirby hate, all the mail, the hate mail from the Kirby people who think <laughs> that I hate Kirby or think that I bad mouth Kirby just because I didn't think. You, you no, know, I think what we're going to have is a series. It all comes of to you guys, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, basically, you know, you're going to have validation. If you've got Fine. some twelve-year-old kid in a Starbucks arguing against Roy Thomas, I'm sorry, <laughs> yeah. I take Roy Thomas. It's more like a 50-year-old geek fanboy, you know, arguing <laughs> against right. Right. Oh! And Otto, any, any last words from this, uh, from our annual? No, here? hey, guys, again, this has always been fantastic. Uh, Mr. Thomas, it's always been great to hang out with you and listen to your stories. And, you know, from a true it's fanboy. Roy. Mr. Thomas who, is my grandfather. Oh, I'm sorry, Roy. Okay, I apologize. <laughs> well, you know, from a true yeah, fanboy, yeah, well, that, when you signed you, my huh? You know, when, when you took time out of the show at that show to sign my T-shirt, which I still have and I love it to death. And uh, it was just always been a pleasure. When you came on Three Men in a Basement in Rhode Island and gave us that time, uh, just more talk to hear this has just been fantastic. I know my partner, Roger, would love to be here, but he's out with his significant other celebrating Valentine's Day. Uh, but again, on behalf of Three Men in a Basement, we appreciate all the time that you give us, that you've given us in the past and hopefully in the future. So thank you very much. I have so many bro. stories. I'm running out, you know. No, I got it. Uh, He's got to put that story to paper. So thank you guys. Steve in the Semino says boom podcast. We thank thankfully we make the 12. We got a hundred more, Roy. And we're gonna get, make sure we bring our mask. I'm gonna be on 50 of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Steve, get us out of here. Okay. Boom. Boom. <laughs>